All right, so I'm so glad for that. Well, okay. anyway, we've been thinking of you all week and hoping everything was going well. I appreciate that. Well, let's, uh, what are we going to be talking about tonight? Well, the thing we have to talk about, of course, once again, is this whole unraveling of the world financial system and the frantic efforts of the people who are the top echelons of this kleptocratic ruling elite to ensure that they're in a pretty good position to capitalize on the misfortune of the rest of us. There was a speech that Mr. Obama gave yesterday in Williamsburg, Virginia, to a group of Democratic congressional and party leaders that I think just perfectly embodies in a sort of capsule form the madness, the derangement of the people who are running this process and the way that they're trying to manipulate the fears of the public into supporting a program and a proposition that's going to ruin what remains of our prosperity. Mr. Obama, of course, has been pushing the so-called stimulus package, which is, to use the Latin phrase, the fancy Latin phrase, an omnium gatherum, that's just a fancy way of saying a grab bag or catch-all, of payoffs and perks and pork payments to various of the constituencies that have their snouts buried deeply into the government trough that serve the interests of the Democratic Party. <clears throat> it's just basically slopping all the familiar troughs with as much money as they possibly can appropriate uh, and call it stimulus. It has nothing to do with building the type of sustaining, self-sustaining economic growth that can only come when you let the free market operate. And, of course, the Republicans have a different set of constituencies whose troughs they would like to slob. And so we had this really cute little dialectic for the last couple of days where the Republicans in the Senate were supposedly dragging their heels after the Republicans in the House voted against the so-called stimulus package. The Republicans in the Senate were putting on this great show of intransigence led by Tom Coburn of Oklahoma, who, from what I understand, is a pretty good man, but unfortunately has become somewhat Republicanized. But he gave a wonderful speech talking about the manifold evils of this so-called stimulus package. And then I saw him on television not 15 minutes later talking about the alternative that the Republicans want to propose, which is roughly half the size of the stimulus package, so-called, that Democrats were proposing. So you've got something that is a huge, ungainly pile of pork, and the Republicans say, well, this is completely unconscionable. Let's reduce it by half. Hold that thought. We'll be right back. So oh, oh, right, oh, go, go right sorry, ahead. The Republicans confronted with something that is just facially unacceptable in terms of what it represents by way of the familiar game of molting the productive to benefit the parasitical. They say it's, it's completely abominable and uh, utterly beyond the pale that we would do this to the tune of $800 billion. Let's only do it to the tune of $400 billion, which, of course, somewhat vindicates the old saw that all that uh, Republican conservatives are are uh, people who tardily embrace whatever heresy the Democrats are promoting on a given week. So they were going to reduce it by half. They didn't have the votes to do that. Now we saw just this evening a compromise proposal that rather than being over $800 billion in spending, or actually it ballooned up to over $900 billion in socialist spending, would be only, quote-unquote, $780 billion, which is larger than the original $750 billion that Obama had proposed. And the Republicans, of course, would consider this a species of victory if it went through. But even that headline tonight was amended even later to say that, well, actually, the range is between $780 and $827 billion. Look, it doesn't matter what figure they put on it right now. I guarantee you... I'm not going to say that I would guarantee it in writing, but I would I would assure you that by the time they're finished with it, it's going to be over a trillion dollars in size. And none of it has anything to do with actual economic growth. Promoting economic growth would mean that we would reduce the size of government. We would reduce the amount of spending that's going on. We would try to do what we can to restore some kind of sound and uh, constitutionally appropriate governance to the economy by getting rid of the Federal Reserve, do what we could to reinstitute sound money as defined by the Constitution. But on route to doing all these wonderful and necessary things, the first thing we would do, if we were interested really in bringing about economic growth in the country, would be to reduce the amount of government spending by roughly a trillion dollars. And instead they're, they're talking about spending a trillion dollars more on that familiar constellation of gimme constituencies that have been part of the Democratic coalition now for decades. 
And so Mr. Obama yesterday, as part of what has been a sputtering and surprisingly ineffective PR campaign for this so-called stimulus package, went to Williamsburg, Williamsburg, Virginia, and made a really remarkable speech before, of course, a hand-picked audience of Democratic Party loyalists, in which he said, among other things, the following, I quote, I don't care if you're driving a hybrid or SUV. If you're driving toward a cliff, you have to change direction. That's what the American people called for. Of course, that's a very sound and telling point. The work is in the applause line. By hold, hold, that, hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and William was talking about because the speech was given yesterday by uh, Mr. Obama in Williamsburg, where he uh, used the analogy of uh, it didn't matter what sort of car you were driving, whether it would be uh, an SUV or simply a hybrid, as long as you're heading towards the cliff, you've got to change direction. That's absolutely right. Yeah. The trouble is uh, that they're doing everything wrong. They are not trying to solve the problem. The problem really came uh, because, of course, of two sources, one of them of course, are the uh, are the faulty housing bonds that were made up of these faulty housing mortgages, and instead of trying to purchase those from places across the world, which they could have done last October with the seven hundred billion dollars they had, they didn't do it because they did not want to solve the problem. Until people understand that, they do not want to solve the problem. They want to make it worse. That's why the Fed has suddenly began paying interest on mm -hmm. the reserves deposited with them and draw it actually actually. Um, uh, said he dried up half a trillion dollars that could have been lent when with fractional reserve backing, uh, b banking, that would have been a, about a five trillion dollars of money yeah. that could have been loaned. It is no longer available. If they wanted to do the right thing, they know what to do, uh, but they made it so complicated the average American doesn't, and they really don't want to save, s solve the problem. Once you understand that, everything going on begins to make sense. Go right ahead, with it? Exactly. The thing that, <clears throat> I find really striking about this figure of speech that Obama used in the speech in Williamsburg yesterday when he talks about the fact that it doesn't matter what kind of vehicle you're driving, you're headed toward a cliff, you have to change the direction. That's what we were elected to do. Of course, they're proceeding in the same direction that they were headed under the Bush administration. And what Obama is proposing is that since we're headed toward a cliff, we have to jump on the accelerator. That's the only way that we can avoid disaster, apparently, is by jumping on the accelerator while heading in the same direction. There's no fundamental change of direction under Obama. We didn't expect anything of the sort to happen. What we expected, and of course, this is something that Obama has already done and validated our suspicions in every particular, is that he has simply changed somewhat the complexion, the political complexion, if you will, of the recipients of this large S. It's basically a case of... of focusing on a certain cluster of domestic constituencies attached to the welfare state as opposed to the fat cat constituencies attached to the, the financial elite and those elements of the, the military-industrial complex that are favored by the Republican Party. That's what happened under Bush the Younger. Mr. Obama has changed by a very minuscule degree the, the preferred uh, lineup or roster of, of recipients and Apart from that, we're heading in the same direction. The direction, of course, is that we're is, is toward absolute, undeniable, unmistakable bankruptcy, and the propellant, of course, is unrestricted, unrestricted deficit spending by the federal government and the creation of inflation by the Federal Reserve and the fractional reserve banking system. Uh, what he's doing is he's stepping on the accelerator, and Congress is complicit in it. it. It's one of those things that is not a matter of party loyalty or race, creed, color, or political persuasion. Uh, in Washington, D.C., there is basically one party. It is an establishment party that is divided into two marketable subgroups. They play to slightly different collections of constituencies, but they prescribe exactly the same policy uh, decisions with respect to foreign policy and with respect to domestic policy. In foreign policy, they're all interventionists. They all believe in a mission for this country that is contrary to our founding precepts. They believe that we should be going abroad. We should be going abroad, contrary to what John Quincy Adams advised us. We should be going abroad in search of monsters to destroy, that we should be entangling ourselves in all the envenomed quarrels of the old world and the oldest of old worlds, the Middle East, in direct contradiction of what uh, George Washington and Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson all agreed should be our foreign policy, which is to remain aloof from those quarrels. 